Uh, you know, when um, Terry and Angelo requested that I deliver this presentation, I was uh, uh, honored to say the least that they had uh, put at least some faith in me. Uh, it was a nice ego boost, having been with the OFH for only two years, but I don't know what I did to get the 8.30 slot on Saturday morning. I obviously ticked somebody off. Um, so in 2013, the MNR distributed two moose population management questionnaires to random moose hunters in the province of Ontario. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the content of those questionnaires or the purpose of those questionnaires was to gather information about uh, hypothetical population management changes that might be amenable to hunters or uh, desirable by hunters. We were hoping to have the results of those questionnaires today, and that was going to make up the bulk of my presentation. Uh, unfortunately, um, given the glacial pace with which the MNR operates at times, we've been told that those results will not be available for another month or two, unfortunately. So I've had to rejig my presentation a little bit and fall back on something that I've delivered to a couple of zones in the past. So to the people who have already seen this, I've, uh, I apologize, but uh, we'll be going through it again in detail and hopefully the people who have not seen it find it valuable. So ultimately, uh, obviously, I ultimately decided that it was still worthwhile to talk about moose management, if only to keep moose management at the forefront of our minds. Because if those questionnaires demonstrated anything, it's that the MNR is thinking about making changes. We don't know what those changes are going to be, and we don't know when they're coming, but they are almost certainly coming. So with that in mind, today I have three broad topics that I'd like to, to cover. The first is the process that the MNR follows to calculate the tag allocation every year. And then we'll talk about how they distribute those tags to hunters through the tag draw. And then I will finish off with a brief discussion about those population management options that were listed on those questionnaires. So the calculation of the tag allocation occurs every year for every unit in moose country, every unit that hosts a moose season. And in the interest of transparency, the MNR provides select stakeholder groups, such as the OFAH, with an opportunity to preview the tag allocation immediately prior to finalization. That happens through a committee called Big Mac, which you may have heard already this weekend, and that stands for the Big Game Management Advisory Committee. And your federation is represented on that committee by three people, myself, Neil Weans, and up until recently, Doug Ogston. But uh, my understanding is that uh, First Bri Vice President Glenn Rivard will be uh, taking up Doug's duties given the state of Doug's health. So we all wish him well. So this is a, a brief 30,000 foot overview of the process uh, for calculating tags. First, the biologist starts by determining the status of the population. They look at the population estimate broken down into the number of bulls, cows, and calves and the observed bull to cow ratio as an indicator of health. And they do that by wildlife management unit. And then they set a goal for that population for that year in relation to the population objective. So for instance, if the population is below the objective, they would likely want to increase it. And conversely, if it's above the objective, they would obviously want to decrease it. And then they set a harvest level that is appropriate for meeting that goal. Now the harvest level can vary anywhere between 4% of the huntable population if you want to increase the moose population all the way up to 20% of the huntable population if you want to decrease the population. And then the program that they use calculates the harvest quota based on the harvest level. And that's simply the number of live animals that are targeted for harvest. And then they apply the projected tag fill rates from the past to attain the calculated number of tags needed in that year. And in the final step of the process, the biologist has an opportunity to adjust those tags based on local information. And I'll give you a good reason why they need to be able to do that. So this is an example of the moose harv results sheet. I apologize, uh, you may not be able to see some of the numbers. I will zoom in a little bit, but uh, they're still a little bit difficult to see. Uh, moose harv is the software program that the MNR uses to calculate the tag allocation every year. And like I said, they do that by unit. 
The uh, result sheet contains quite a bit of information, as you can see, uh, the district that the unit is in, the survey ecological zone that, it's, uh, that the unit is in, as well as the moose population objective for that survey ecological zone, for the entire zone. It also includes the, the number of tags that were issued in the previous hunting season, as well as, as well as the planned and actual harvest in the previous hunting season. So as I said, the biologist starts by looking at the most recent moose aerial inventory data. They look at the total population size, which in this case is 3,708 animals, broken down into the number of bulls, cows, and calves, and then observe bull-to-cow ratio in this example of 60 bulls per 100 cows. And then they look at that population status in relation to the population objective. So they've estimated a total huntable population of 3,771 moose. The trend in the population is stable. And unfortunately, or it may depend on if you're a moose hunter in this area, the population is actually 500 animals above the objective. And believe it or not, there are units in the province where moose exceed the population objective. So in this case, the biologist has set the harvest level at 11% of the huntable population. So the first calculation that we do is simply to take 11% of 3,771 animals. That gives us 415 live moose targeted for harvest. Now, because we have an unregulated, unregulated calf harvest system in the province, we need to account for a certain level of calf harvest in that total allowable harvest. So based on past information, the biologist has estimated that about 30% of the total allowable harvest will be made up of calves. So if we take 30% of 415 moose, that gives us 125 calves. Now we don't allocate calf tags in this unit, so those calves are accounted for, but at this point they're essentially forgotten. They're removed from the total allowable harvest and ignored for the rest of the calculation process essentially. So if we take 125 calves out of the 415 total allowable harvest, that leaves us with 290 adult moose to be allocated. Now we have to determine how many of those 290 are going to be bulls and how many of those are going to be cows. If we go back up to the observed bull to cow ratio in the, mo in the most recent moose aerial inventory, it was 60 bulls per 100 cows. Now, the MNR has set an ideal target bull-to-cow ratio of approximately 67 bulls per 100 cows. So this population is actually fairly healthy in that respect. It's close, although slightly below that target. <clears throat> so the biologist has set the bull-to-cow ratio of the harvest at 90 bulls per 100 cows applying just slightly more harvest pressure to the cow component in an attempt to bring that bull to cow ratio a little bit closer to 67 bulls per 100 cows. So if we apply the bull to cow ratio of 90 bulls per 100 cows to the 290 adult moose that needs to be allocated, it comes out to 138 bulls and 152 cows. And that's total. Now in most units, there is a gun hunt as well as a bow's hunt or a bow's only hunt, I should say. But because the demand by bow hunters is generally quite a bit less than it is by gun hunters, the biologist can, for the most part, just eyeball the number of moose that need to be allocated to the bow hunters, simply to, uh, to allocate sufficient numbers to meet demand. And that's what they've done in this case. So we had a 415 moose to be harvested in the total allowable harvest, 39 of those have been dedicated for the, the boas only hunt, leaving 376 moose to the gun hunt. So now we have to determine how to split those moose between residents and non-residents. Now provincial policy states that no more than 10% of the total allowable harvest in any given unit can be given to the outfitters, to the tourist industry. And in this case, it happens to be 7.2% of the total allowable harvest. So if we take 7.2% of the 415, which is the total allowable harvest for that year, comes out to 30 moose. Now because outfitters, for the most part at least, can market a gun hunt, much more so than a bow hunt, 
at least that's what they put most of their effort into, those 30 animals are taken off of the previous gun allocation. As I mentioned, it was 376. It has now been reduced to 346, and those 30 animals have been dedicated to the outfitters. So let's pause for a moment and figure out where we are. All we've done so far is determine how many moose need to be harvested. We've determined how many of those are going to be bulls, cows, and calves. And we've allocated those to outfitters, resident gun hunters, and resident bow hunters. The next step in the process, and actually the final step in the software process, is to apply the projected tag fill rate to the harvest allocation. And the projected tag fill rate is simply a moving average of the previous three to five years of tag fill rates. So it's based directly on hunter information, the information that hunters provide through mandatory questionnaires and or the postcard surveys. So if we take the harvest allocation and divide it by the, projected, the appropriate projected tag fill rate, we end up with the calculated adult tags. Now all we've done so far, that's essentially the end of the line for the software program, for the calculations. All the software has done is spit out a bunch of numbers based on the numbers that the biologists input earlier on in the program. And as I mentioned earlier, the final step in the process gives the, the biologist the opportunity to adjust those tags. The biologist now needs to look at the calculated adult tags and determine if any changes need to be made. Now you may be asking, why would the biologist need to make any changes? Because he set all the information earlier on in the program, and the program has simply spit out the results. He already had input. He needs to be able to make the changes for two reasons. One of those reasons is that there's a, I'm pretty sure it's an unwritten policy, but a policy nonetheless, that biologists won't make small, sort of minor tweaks or changes to the tag allocation from year to year. So for instance, if in this year, the, the, uh, the program is telling it to calculate, say, three or four fewer tags than it did in the previous year, the biologist likely won't make that change at all. The biologist will likely hold tags steady. Because a change in, in three or four tags isn't gonna make a world of difference in the ultimate uh, scheme of things. It won't risk the sustainability of the hunt in any way. The second reason, <clears throat> the second reason is to get rid of what I call phantom hunting opportunities. You may not be able to see it. I'll zoom in a little bit here. If you go back to the harvest allocation of cows to the resident bow hunt, they had allocated 14 animals, 14 cows to resident bow hunters. But due to the, but given the extremely low projected tag fill rate of only 2% for resident bow hunters, the program has calculated that the biologists can allocate 875 cow tags to the resident bow hunters. But the biologist looks at previous demand for cow tags by bow hunters and recognizes that demand has never exceeded more than 150 or 175 tags. So the biologist in this case, in this example, has justifiably reduced that number from 875 down to 200, which is more than enough to meet demand for cow tags by bow hunters. So that that's essentially the first sheet that we see when we review um, the moose tag allocation. What we don't see here, and you don't see it because I wasn't allowed to show you, is the comment section that follows each of these for each unit. The comment section gives the biologist the opportunity to justify any of the numbers, any of the, uh, the statistics that they've included, and to provide any sort of ancillary information that they might think is important, say if there was a, a recent winter tick infestation or why they set the harvest level on 11% as opposed to 10%, or if they accounted for any Métis or Aboriginal harvest. Information like that that isn't reflected in any of the calculation steps. All of that gets included in the comment section, which is absolutely invaluable to understanding the justification behind that year's allocation. So now that we've determined how many tags are going to be allocated to hunters, we have to figure out how to get those tags to hunters. And that happens through the adult validation tag draw, which I'm sure any moose hunter in the room is, is going to be familiar with. And in fact, anybody who reads the hunting summary in, in great detail is probably familiar with it as well because the process is listed right in there. So you might be asking why I'm going to be going over this if it's already in the hunting summary. 
I'm going to go over it because I've only been here for two years, roughly, and I can count, or I need two hands to count the number of times that I've spoken to seasoned moose hunters and have been able to shine some light on the intricacies of this system that they had either never known or had forgotten. So I think it's valuable to, uh, to always, um, I guess, reread that section of the hunting summary or speak to someone who, who works with it in detail. <clears throat> so the first step in the, um, the tag draw is a guaranteed group allocation, which is based on the guaranteed group size. The guaranteed group size is calculated as the, the average number of applicants in the past divided by the current level of tags. So if, for instance, there have been 900 applicants in a given unit in the past three to five years, and the current level of tags is 100, the hunter tag ratio is calculated as, as nine, and the guaranteed group size would likely be set at nine or somewhere close, could be eight, could be 10, depending on how much risk the biologist wants to manage for. So that means, let's say for instance, the guaranteed group size is 10 in this given unit. That means that any application that contains the names of 10 or more pool one, choice one applicants automatically gets a tag. And that tag is awarded and assigned to the pool one applicant who has applied consistently and has gone the longest without receiving a tag in their name. So their name isn't necessarily drawn. It's assigned to them because they've been the least successful, let's say. And at that point, all co-applicants are removed from the draw. So assuming that a certain level of hunters and a certain number of tags have been removed from the system in the first step, the program recalculates the hunter tag ratio and then rounds it up to the next whole number. So if, for instance, the hunter tag ratio is now 5.7, any group that has six or more pool one choice one applicants on it automatically gets a tag. And again, that tag goes to the person who has applied consistently and has gone the longest without receiving a tag. And again, all co-applicants are removed from the draw. And the third step in the process is the random draw allocation. At this point, all remaining pool one choice one applicants go into a pool and are eligible to receive one of the remaining tags. And at this point in the process, every pool one choice one applicant has a statistically identical chance of receiving a tag in their name. And if a tag is allocated to a member of a group, again, all of the co-applicants are removed from the draw. Now, if they go through that for pool one, choice one applicants, and there are still tags remaining, then they repeat the large group allocation step and the random draw allocation step for pool one, choice two, and pool two, choice one, and pool two, choice two hunters. There aren't a whole lot of units in the province where, where you can get through all of the pool one, choice one applicants, though. This is a graph of the hunter tag ratio in wildlife management units that hosted a moose season in 2012. The wildlife management units are on the bottom. You don't need to necessarily know what those numbers are. And on the y-axis is the, whatever the hunter tag ratio was in 2012. Now legally, it's stipulated regu uh, regulation, legally you cannot have more than 15 names listed on an application. That's the legal maximum. So the red bars indicate wildlife management units where the hunter tag ratio, where the demand was so high that the hunter tag ratio exceeded the legal maximum number of applicants on an application. So why is that important? Well, it's important because of the three steps I just described. In these units in 2012, because the hunter tag ratio was so great, there would have been no guaranteed group size. So if there's no guaranteed group size, step one of the process is bypassed. Step two of the process, they recalculate the hunter tag ratio. It's identical to what it was in the first step, still above the legal maximum. Step two is bypassed. And step three is the random draw allocation in which every pool one, choice one applicant has a statistically identical chance of receiving a tag in their name. Just keep that in mind for a moment. Step four in the draw is the northern resident allocation. So in units one through 42, north of the French and Mattawa rivers, <clears throat> pardon me, 5% of the adult tag quota is withheld specifically for residents of those units who are unsuccessful in the draw in the current draw year as well as the previous two draw years. So for three draw years in a row. 
Those names are put into a draw, and they are drawn at random. Now, if any tags remain unallocated after this step, those tags go into the surplus tag system, which is a first come, first serve system. It's a telephone line. I believe it runs for four or six hours, one weekday evening in the summer. So there's a, a huge rush of hunters to that line to, to try to grab an unallocated tag. <clears throat> I get this question quite a bit. Um, I'm pretty sure many of our board members get this question fairly often as well. Um, the MNR recommends applying as a group. In fact, they go so far as to recommend that right in the hunting summary. But people always ask me, does it make a difference? And the answer is, as with most things, it depends. It depends on the popularity of the wildlife management unit. So if you think back to the graph I showed you a moment ago of the hunter tag ratios, in those units, as I mentioned, step one is bypassed. There's no guaranteed group size. Step two is bypassed. And step three is the random draw allocation. So in those units in 2012, the first step in the draw process where any names are drawn, everyone has a statistically identical chance of being drawn. So statistically, in those units, it does not matter whether you apply as a group or as an individual. But of course, we have to take into account hunter motivation and hunter behavior. So it's often helpful to speak to the hunter and ask them how they like to hunt and how many animals they like to hunt and so on and so forth. One of the questions that we always ask them is, are you going to be hunting as a group regardless? And if so, are you, are you comfortable with a single adult validation tag? Well, if you are, then go ahead and apply as a group. Because if any of the group members' names is drawn, all the co-applicants are removed, you'll be hunting together with one adult validation tag. But every once in a while, people come to me and say, you know what, I can only hunt in my unit every seven, eight, 10 years. Why would I bother applying as a group? This year, me and my hunting buddies want to maximize the number of adult validation tags we might get. So I recommend applying, in those instances at least, applying as individuals. If you apply as a group, you can't get more than one adult validation tag through the draw in that unit. So apply as individuals. And even though the chances are slim, it is possible that more than one of your group members could receive a tag in their name. But of course, keeping in mind that any person who receives a tag in their name is dropped into the lower preference pool, call it pool two, and they are uneligible to receive a tag generally the next year, depends on the unit, of course. So there are a lot of considerations uh, in answering this question. It really helps to, to speak to hunters and uh, really determine what their motivations are. So now I want to transition and end off with a brief discussion about the future moose population management options. Like I said, I, I wish we had the results of those questionnaires, but. Uh, Unfortunately, um, I'm actually not entirely surprised we don't. The option that we've heard the most about uh, with respect to those questionnaires is some sort of change to the unregulated calf harvest system that we have in the province. The MNR is considering implementing a calf tag allocation and a draw in some northern wildlife management units, similar or identical actually to the uh, calf tag allocations that currently exist in wildlife management units 48, 55 A and B and 57. Now that gives the MNR direct and much tighter control over the number of calves that could be harvested in that unit. They could also shorten the hunting season specifically for calf moose. So for instance, in some of these northern wildlife management units, the gun season can be five or six weeks long. So the MNR might stipulate that you could only harvest calves in say the first week or say the last week of that longer season. But if they can't directly protect calves, we might see an overall reduction in the number of adult validation tags. And the purpose of this option would be to protect the reproductive component of the population, to ensure that there are sufficient prime bulls and prime cows in the right proportions in that population to maximize production. And if you consistently maximize production in a unit, you could probably get away with unregulated calf harvest for the most part. We might also see some changes to the timing of moose seasons. So for instance, <clears throat> they could begin moose season later, push opening day back past the peak of the rut when moose are most vulnerable, in theory reducing the number of moose that are harvested in total. 
or they could end the moose season earlier. The theory would be to close moose season before there was any snow on the ground, making it difficult, if not impossible, for hunters to track moose in the snow. And finally, in some of those wildlife management units where the gun season is pretty long, they could actually split that gun season into two separate seasons, one early season and one late season, with a closed period in between. Now, we actually haven't heard much detail about this option specifically, but if I were a wildlife manager, I'm, I'm assuming that that closed period would probably be about two weeks long and would coincide again with the peak of the rut when moose are most vulnerable. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention this morning, and I am more than happy to take any questions you might have. So if anyone has any questions, just step up to the mics. I'll let you explain. Go ahead. Hi, Mark. Gary. <coughs> Yes, uh, my name's Jerry Giesler. I'm from uh, Zone D, represent the Golden Tringle Hunt Club. Um, I just have a couple questions for you, actually three all together. Uh, first of all, uh, in the guaranteed group allocation that you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, that's the first step. Yes. Um, now, this is not a complaint. I actually like this, um, but I just can't, I just wanna understand how it works. In Zone 47, if you do the numbers, there is no, no, no chance of a guaranteed uh, tag in there. And yet, right. every year, they're issuing guaranteed tags, mm. which is a good thing. Now, yeah. I'm assuming that this is to increase the number of big people applying as big groups because it never had a guaranteed before and everybody was applying as singles and, and so. So can you explain to me why they're doing that? or? Well, unfortunately, that, that's going to come down to the district biologist's discretion and how much risk they are willing to manage. Um, unfortunately, I can't really um, put words in that biologist's mouth, but sometimes they do maintain a guaranteed group size. Even though the hunter tag ratio is well above the legal maximum, some biologists maintain a guaranteed group size at that maximum level of 15, again, to encourage people to apply as groups and to maintain some hunting opportunities for those larger groups, get more people out on the landscape. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That, that, that's so, what I thought. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's why they're doing that? Uh, that's my assumption, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so uh, the second one was when you talked about applying as a group, okay, um, whether it made a difference or not, it actually does make a slight difference mm -hmm. uh, if everybody applies as a group because those numbers, as those numbers of uh, co-applicants come out, then it, it increases the odds of all the other remaining people of getting a tag. Yeah, but statistically, but, after all those people are removed and say there are 500 people left, statistically, everybody has an identical chance. So yes, those yeah. odds do change <laughs> every time. Yes, yeah. But after those people are removed, there's a yeah. statistically identical chance. Right. So I do okay. see where you're going, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and the third one is, is uh, in the future management options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they're talking about all the different seasons and that. Uh, this is not really a question, this is just more of a comment. Okay. Um, I was very disappointed that we went through all this with the moose management thing back in 2008, 2009, and they did absolutely nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Now they've done this other one, and they're dragging their heels and doing absolutely nothing with it. I think we need to kick them in the butt and get them going. Yeah, you sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I share your opinion, so yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, good morning, Frank. Uh, Frank Wick from Ajax. Today. One thing you didn't mention, and that's completely uh, relevant to his first question, actually, is that a, a great many, including the wildlife management that I hunt in, 61, uh, there is no guaranteed group size sometimes, but they, what they term in large group allocations. And you didn't even mention that. No, unfortunately, I did have to remove some detail from my okay, presentation. So, that's, but yeah. <laughs> so in, our, in the case of my hunt camp, uh, it, uh, because we are, we make sure that there, there's actually three groups that hunt together, total of 23 to 24 people. So we are provided everybody gets their stuff in on time, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we, d we do end up getting one cow, one bull each year. 
Uh, and yeah. but there's no guarantee of that. But yeah. we do get it just because of what they call the large group allocation. Yeah, and that's at the the district biologist's right. discretion. There are a lot of district biologists that would not do that. Right. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a standard process. Yeah. Just a comment about surplus tag allocations mm -hmm. that uh, occur at the end of the uh, application period. Um, probably a few of us around the room have tried to get in on that phone uh, period of time. I know I've sat for uh, hours pushing the redial, and then at the end of the fourth hour, you may get through and the tags are all completely gone. Right. And I often wondered if it mightn't be a better idea to extend the uh, period of, uh, of, of phone opportunities, and then uh, the people that are in uh, that um, position to apply for those surplus tags if they could have a lottery instead of first come first serve on the phone. It's really frustrating and I've got the time now that I'm retired and I can sit and push redial but even that you don't get through. Yeah. And I thought maybe it would be a fairer chance and maybe Big Mac could uh, take that idea and try to apply it and, and make it a little more fair than what it applies uh, right now, it's really difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have made recommendations through the OFH Big Game Committee and through Big Mac to the MNR about changing various changes actually to the to the draw system. Uh, that is one of them. One of the key considerations about the surplus tag system is that everybody says, why don't they make it longer? Well, ultimately, because all of the unallocated tags are allocated at the end of that four hours, it actually doesn't make a difference if they make it any longer because they're all gone already. Yeah, but if you had a lottery for those tags, yep. and, I think the, and let everybody that applies for it have an equal chance, yeah, I think as, the, as opposed to the uh, opportunity of, uh, of success at an earlier time in that time period, so. I think the best route is actually to change what step that is. If you make the northern resident allocation the first step in the draw, or even the third step in the draw prior to the random draw allocation, you would eliminate that need. You would allocate as many tags to eligible northern resident hunters as possible. Yeah. Anything that remains unallocated does not go into the surplus tag system. It goes into the regular draw system, oh. which at this point will not have been run. The way it's set up now is because it's the last step in the process. There's nothing after it. There's nothing else to do yeah. but put them in the surplus tag system. But if you change the arrangement of the system, you might be able to allocate yeah. them all through the draw. I appreciate your looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Morning, Mark. My morning, name morning. is Wally Motes. I'm out of uh, Zone H. My question is on uh, northern draw tickets. It's been brought up at the big game quite a few times. And uh, the question being that uh, there was a survey done by Bruce Hamilton that a lot of the northern draw tags were not applied for. And if I cre uh, remember correctly, there was 800 and some odd tags available. There was only 300 and some odd tags that were drawn. There mm -hmm. were some WMUs that weren't even uh, applied for northern draw tickets. Is it possible to try and get the MNR to drop that 5% down way lower or eliminate it altogether and leave those tickets in the regular draw? Yeah, that's a great, uh, um, that's a great suggestion, Wally. And as you're aware, as a member of the, the Big Game Advisory Committee, you're aware that that is one of the recommendations we have made to the MNR in the past, either to well, to look at the northern resident allocation and determine, based on past demand, what demand should be. It's never been 5%. No. There have never been that many eligible northern resident hunters to take up all 5% of the tags that are allocated to them. I don't think it's ever been more than 3.5%. So we might be able to get away with dropping that number, as you said, from 5% to, to something a little more reflective of the number of hunters that are actually eligible to get tags. My, I got another comment to make. In our group, we have 11 hunters basically every year, and we've been fortunate enough in the years gone by that we draw one bull, one cow every year. And uh, I think if everybody in this room here goes by the application and, and the group sizing, your chance of getting adult validation tags are a lot better than applying individually. Yeah, you, you certainly have to take into account uh, where you want to hunt. I mean, there are definitely a lot of wildlife management units in the province that still have a guaranteed group size. It may be high, and it's probably different for bulls and for cows, and you might have to travel, but it, it certainly is possible. Thank you. Thanks, Wally. Morning, John. Hi, Mark. Uh, John Ford, Own Sound. Um, I just want, I, w I would just like to ask you if, 
um, when, you're, when you go to your next Big Mac meeting, if you can emphasize something that I've talked to MNR staff about for many years, and that is the IVR system. Mm. Um, I'm retired like Fred, so I can spend the time to try to get into that system. And we all know that if MNR had more phone lines, people wouldn't have to wait so long. But for the people who have to work and have to try to get into that, and the frustration that they have, I'm surprised there are very many phones around that aren't broken because it's ridiculous. And I've told MNR staff about this for the last at least 10 years and I see no change every year and, and it's not right. We're paying for that service. MNR is making money on the IVR system mm -hmm. and they should be providing the service that hunters deserve. You're absolutely right, John. And uh, Neil Weans is the chair of Big Mac, and we have a meeting on Tuesday. So I would ask Neil to uh, file that away for Tuesday, and we can bring that up again. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>